so if you're paying attention and you listen to Kevin's words and you looked at the call to worship, the Psalm 100, um, Noe's presentation of the call to worship, you see a theme here today, and we're going to continue that same theme in our scripture text. So we're going to the very last chapter of John, a very intimate moment that Jesus has with his disciples, and in particular, the disciple Peter. So listen to God's word to you. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we give thanks for your word to us, and we give thanks for the truth it has in our lives, and we ask your spirit to help us discern how we might apply those words to our lives this day. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So if you were here two weeks ago on kickoff Sunday, you knew I picked up on a little bit on the football theme and, and we gave a prayer of thanksgiving for President Teddy Roosevelt for saving football by allowing the forward pass way back in 1906, and we challenged ourselves that we as Highland members, as individuals, and as a church might be willing to do something new, like throw a pass in our coming year through our strategic planning and whatever it takes to grow the church for the sake of Jesus Christ. So today I want to keep a little bit of this football theme going because today is the opening day of the NFL season. As all of you know, as you'll be uh, watching the TV and especially the Eagles play today. And we know it's going to be a great season when the Chiefs upset the Patriots. Isn't that a great season? Uh, Gary Korn, where are you Gary? I don't think Gary's here, right? Um, And there's a certain staff person who has these walls plastered of Patriot stuff. Now, when I said that, Chiefs, Patriots, you knew who I was talking about, right? You knew it was the Kansas City Chiefs and the New England Patriots. And you knew this because you recognized the mascot. You recognized the logo or the image, and there's a brand name here going, and mascots are very important important to society. You find them in all realms of society. You can see them in schools, obviously professional teams. The military uses mascots with units and squadrons. Various societies that we have 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 mascots. And um, it really is kind of a brand name, isn't it? You You can understand what we're talking about through a mascot. So a mascot, it can be a person, it can be an animal, it can be an object which is supposed to bring luck or anything used to represent the group in order for their public common identity to be known. And since it's opening day of the NFL, I started looking up some of these mascots and it's really amazing. Sometimes there are fierce animals that are mascots of the various teams that we have. We have Wolverines, Badgers, Jaguars, Tigers, Panthers, Diamondbacks. We have bears and we have lions, which are different from Nittany lions. Which one yesterday? And that should get a standing ovation, shouldn't it? But 
Uh, Nittany lion, I looked it up. Do you know what it is? It's a cougar. It's a mountain lion. Right, it's a puma. It's a, uh, I always wondered what a nittany was, so now I know. See what I've learned already from this sermon. And, and you can also see fierce birds as mascots. You have the eagles, right? Go eagle. Oh, no, we won't do that. Ravens, falcons, warhawks, seahawks. We have jayhawks. And some not so ferocious birds like the ducks or the penguins. But I might say that either of them is probably more intimidating than what is probably understood to be some kind of a big letter P coming toward you on their chest when we talk about the Philadelphia Flyers, which still doesn't keep me from having it on my license plate on the front of my car. Not intimidating too many people, I think. You've got here also in, uh, tough people. Well, who are the tough people? The Vikings, the Giants, the Buccaneers, the Raiders, the Fighting Irish, the Celtics, and maybe you could include even a Patriot in there if you wanted to as a tough person. This one is really difficult because it's politically incorrect these days to have indigenous peoples like the Chiefs or the Indians or the Braves or the Scouts or the Blackhawks, the Redskins. And so we look at our local area and we see mascots. Of course, you have the Lancaster Barnstormers, right? And who are the Blackhawks? What area? What school district? The Blackhawks. I'm oh, sorry, the Black Knights. Hempfield. Who are the Warriors? Warwick. Blue Streaks, Manon Township. The Buckskins. Conestoga Valley. You go, team. Okay. Red Tornadoes. McCaskey. You guys are good. But let's go back to the animals. Now, sometimes people use a ram. And it's normally a bighorn ram, a well-known mascot. Sometimes, if you're out west, it's very well-known. Cam, the ram, from what college? Colorado State. We have Cam, the ram. Now, if you're down south, and I see Lori walking through the narthex, because if you're a UNC fan, it's, it's really hard to have a Tar Heel as a mascot. And so they have Ramses, the ram, which is, and I wonder what he's always thought about having his horns painted blue. But, um, but that's a well-known ram. But what you won't see on, as a logo on any helmet or the front of a shirt or as a mascot to intimidate the other team, what you won't ever see in the fierce animal category is a sheep. Now, doesn't that just give you fear and intrepidation? <laughs> you see, I started thinking about this. You have rams, and, but you don't have sheep. And I thought, well, what's the difference? So I looked it up on the Internet. A ram is, there's a ram, ewe, lamb, and mutton. All those come under the category of sheep. A ram is a breedable male. A, you is a female sheep, a lamb is a very young sheep, and a mutton is, well, let's call him a non-functionable male. <laughs> and you can figure that one out afterwards, all right, if you talk to me. So then I started thinking about horns. Well, I didn't know that some breeds, both male and female, have horns. Some breeds, both male and female, don't have horns, and some breeds, the males have horns, and the females don't have horns. But rams are pretty ferocious animals. And when you see them fighting by butting their heads and horns together, you begin to understand why ram as a verb refers to a ship when they intentionally collide with one another, ramming one another with the sole purpose of damaging or sinking the other ship. So we get back to sheep, sheep, the most um, used animal in all the Bible, over 200 references on sheep. Now, you, can, you know they're important in the Bible with so many references, and there are 
two main reasons that they're important. One is because of the nomadic livelihood that the Hebrew people had and many people in that region. And the other is because in symbolically, the sheep are very important because they've, they represent the people of God all the way through the Bible, all the way from Old Testament through New Testament. Some of the most common scripture passage referring to sheep or shepherd are, and you remember, Psalm 23. As you've heard it so many times, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. Or you might think of our call to worship that we use in Psalm 100. We are his, God's people, the sheep of his pasture. And in the New Testament, probably the most said about sheep is found in John 10, when your heading is probably the good shepherd and the sheep, because more than half the chapter is talking about Jesus as the good shepherd and the relationship with the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, a couple things we learn from the scriptures about sheep. One, sheep follow the shepherd. On their own, sheep have no sense of direction. They get lost very easily. They easily wander away from the rest of the flock when they just start following the next grazing area along the pasture. As we said in our confession of Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Sheep are really good at following. They follow the one who they know loves them and cares for them. The one who, as Matthew says in chapter 18, leaves the 99 in order to save the one. Sheep are good followers because, two, sheep are in close relationship with the shepherd. They spend much time together never getting too far out of sight of one another, never too far away from each other for any length of time. The shepherd protects his flock and, as we said, would give his life for that sheep. And sheep feel the shepherd's protection from wolves and all the troubles that surround them. Third, sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd but not any shepherd. The sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. No other shepherd, just their shepherd. Before the days of massive herding, this was the way that sheep were separated into herds after they'd been grazing in a big group. They needed no markings, no tags, to distinguish them, all they needed was to hear the voice of their shepherd, and they would divide up into the different herds. But sheep not only recognize the voice of their shepherd, they fourthly respond to the voice of their shepherd. That voice is the one that brings them comfort and security. The shepherd calls the sheep, and they come. They respond because they know that that shepherd is their leader. So they follow the one with whom they have a close relationship and whose voice they recognize with familiarity and understanding. I know what you're thinking. A sheep? That's our mascot? It's easy if we were to maybe wear an eagle or a lion, but a sheep? Remember, who is the one who chose the mascot? God. All through the scriptures. God could have chosen an animal with sharp, ferocious claws. 
or a bird with magnificent wings and powerful talons. But God chose the animal that is best at following, a sheep. The one in close and trusting relationship. The one whose voice it recognizes through familiar words that they've heard before and over and over again and familiar sayings of the master. And the one to which it will respond by doing what it's told. That's why the sheep is the best mascot for Christians. But Jesus goes one step further. Just before Jesus leaves the earth, he instructs Simon Peter to care for the dearest object of his life, his sheep. Yes, the sheep is a mascot for us, reminding us who we are and who's leading our team. But it's also a reminder of Jesus' command of, for us regarding all of his sheep, all of his people. In our text, Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? A lot of studies on this text, of course, the three denials of Peter are overcome by these three acclamations. The word, different words of love, the different words for sheep. Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus responds, feed my sheep. Was Jesus unaware of Peter's love? I don't think so. His threefold question was not for himself, it was for Peter. He asks his questions to underscore this essential truth, one that we can apply to our faith as individuals this day, that only love for Jesus Christ will sustain Peter or us in the ministry before us. The arduous, demanding work of caring for people's souls. Jesus did not ask Peter if he loved his sheep. He asked Peter if he loved Jesus. Affection for God's people in itself will not sustain us. You know how sheep are. They can be unresponsive, unappreciative, harshly critical of our efforts to love and serve them. Our love of Christ, our love of Him, no other, is the only sufficient motivation that will enable us to stay the course, to continue to feed the flock of God. So Jesus is asking Peter, but if we put Peter's sandals on, He's really asking us, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. It's always helpful to remember Matthew 25 in this context. Remember that chapter of the sheep and the goats, the final judgment? The sheep-type people on the right, the goat-type people on the left, these on the right are welcomed in the kingdom of God. Those on the left, they're told to depart from Christ's presence. Now, why are these on the right welcomed? Because they feed his sheep. Jesus even has to remind them of this. When you saw someone hungry, you fed him. When you saw someone thirsty, you gave them something to drink. When you saw a stranger, you invited them in. This is what it means to be people following Jesus. Sheep following a shepherd. Feeding his sheep. This is why the sheep is the best 
mascot for Christians. It reminds us that Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for us. And that we are to follow Jesus by responding to his voice, feeding his sheep. So let's all rally around our team here at Highland with our best mascot rally cry possible. How does a sheep cry? What's it say? <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question. I want to hear your rally cry. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you love the Good Shepherd? Yeah. Go team. <laughs> Amen. And the offering. You see, it follows this message intentionally, directly, because it's an easy way to show that you want to feed sheep, to feed his sheep, to make a donation. The Presbyterian Disaster Assistance for the people of Harvey, for the people of Irma, for the people of Jose. And all those will suffer from the horrific winds. So I told the ushers I'd like to pray before the offering today. So would you pray with me, please? God of our life, whose presence sustains us in every circumstance, in storm and distress, we welcome the restoring power of your love and compassion. We open our hearts <clears throat> in sorrow, gratitude, and hope that those who have been spared nature's furry, fury, as well as those whose lives are changed forever by the ravages of wind and water, may find solace, sustenance, and strength in the days of recovery and rebuilding that come. We ask for sustaining courage for those who are suffering, wisdom and diligence for those directing relief efforts, and for generosity to flow as powerfully as rivers and streams as we, your people, respond to the deep human needs beginning to emerge in the wake of these storms. In these days of relief, Open our hearts and open our hands that we might heed your call to feed my sheep. In the name of Jesus, our good shepherd, we pray. Amen.